نحمد ہو و نسل علیہ رسول کریم اما بعد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ربی زبن علما رب شرخ لی صبری و سر لی عمری و اخل الوقت تم لسانی یفقہو قولی السلام علیکم دیر سسٹرز ویلکم بیک ٹو آر کلاس فو دی جینی فرو دی قرآن And today, inshallah, we will be going through Surah Sath. Um, we will be going through uh, the first um, few ayahs, well, 113 ayahs of Surah Sath, inshallah. Before we do that, we will um, do a recap of what we learned last week. So last week, we had the pleasure of um, learning Surah Yasin, and it was an uh, amazing Surah. We learned so many things that we did not know from the past. We did not know um, how, you know, we did not know what the actual surah said, even though we are so, um, we read it so much, we read, hear about it so much. We, um, every time, you know, there's a death or there's a, 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 um, um, a difficult time, we're told to go ahead and read this surah. But we've never really known what it actually means. Last week, alhamdulillah, we had the pleasure of um, going into it, reading the um, very, very brief tafsil. So what we're actually doing is not so sort of like, you know, um, in depth, we are doing it, uh, we are doing a very brief tafsil. Even the brief tafsil teaches us so much that at the end of each surah, we're sitting there thinking, oh my God, you know, so many things in that surah, and we, we knew nothing of them. And even if it's not, a, uh, let's just say that we didn't read the brief surah, we just read the um, translation. Even that in itself gives us so much knowledge. It's, it's you know, it's um, sort of like breathtaking. So let's go through what we learned last week. So last week we learned that this is the revelation which is sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is this? It's the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent. And Allah is the Almighty and the All-Merciful and He sent it due to the fact that He's mighty and merciful. So it is um, in order to warn a people whose forefathers were not warned and therefore they were heedless. So it was um, uh, first and foremost for the people of Mecca who um, originated, who were the descendants of uh, um, Ibrahim alayhi salam and his son um, uh, Ismail alayhi salam. Now, there had been generations and generations and generations had gone past and people were now um, sort of like doing their own thing with regards to religion. They were making um, a religion to be their, whatever they wanted it to be, to sort of like, you know, fill in their fancy basically. So they had because there were so many generations that had gone past, not only those people themselves, but their fathers and their forefathers and people who were um, uh, close to them, people who they looked up to, nobody knew, nobody had uh, had been warned. So this Quran was sent to warn them. And then we learned that Allah gives life and Allah causes death. And also everything you do is recorded and sent before you. Not only everything that you do is recorded and sent before you, but also the um, the effects of what you have done, the effects of what you have learned, the effects of what um, your actions, how what they caused to other people. So it is so many things that you doing something, you may think it's only little, I just did it because uh, I was angry at the time or um, just um, uh, in a bolt of frustra uh, frustration. But those words, those actions have consequences and people will um, suffer from those consequences and you will be responsible for those uh, consequences. And even things like walking to the masjid, talking to somebody on the way home, making them feel better, saying something nice to someone, that also has an effect. And that effect will also be in your record if you, um, uh, if you have made them feel good. And so everything that you do, are um, is recorded and the effects of what you do is also recorded as well then we learned about the story of the dwellers of the town it is says that the uh, town was uh, it was uh, called antioch and there were sent messengers to that town it was two messengers and because people denied them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala due to his mercy sent a third again same thing people denied the third one as well 
they denied all the messengers. And the reason they denied the messengers is because they said, you are just human beings like us. And this is um, uh, uh, another uh, uh, thing that's been quite consistent, that people um, tend to think that you cannot be a prophet because you're, uh, you're just a human being. Prophets were human beings. It's just um, the fact that when people want to deny, then they use silly excuses. So they said, oh, well, how can you be a human being? How can you be a prophet when you are a human being? So, and, and they also said that we don't think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed anything. You're just telling lies. And they, they went on to say how, you know, we think you're an evil omen to, for us. And if you don't um, stop all this preaching, then we will surely stone you. Now, this was something that is... Um, people always do this they threaten you with things if you don't if you don't listen to us we will throw a stone you and we will um, um, sort of like cause your death then we learned that a man came running from the farthest part of the town he said oh my people obey these messengers why should we not obey these messengers when we know that Allah has created us Allah has sent us to this dunya and to Allah we are going back so if we if we've been created by Allah and we're going back to Allah then what about this middle time, this time in this dunya? Why should we not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this was also um, uh, sort of like a, an indication to us that sometimes people around you, they will not believe. And someone that will come from a quite a distance, they will believe. So he, he came, he said this to the people, and the people killed him. So when he was killed by these people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him to enter, uh, enter paradise. And he was still concerned about his people. He, he didn't just say, oh, well, there you go. They didn't listen to me. I told them this. They, they killed me. I'm in paradise. Let's ignore them. No, he said, oh, oh you know, um, only if my people knew that my Lord has forgiven me and has made me one of the honored ones. So he wanted his people to know that his Lord is, you know, merciful and so on even though he was killed by these people. In the dunya, he was kind to the people by telling them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after his death, he was still concerned about his people because he wanted to go back and tell, tell his people about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was treating him. And then we learned that everything in the dunya is created in pairs. So um, you know, human beings, male and female, um, the dunya and the akhirah, so everything is in male and female and of course we do not know you know when we see things we, we we can't tell male female but the quran tells us that everything is in pairs everything allah has allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made in pairs like the night and the day the um, uh, um jannah and jahannam the dunya and the akhirah so it's everything is in pairs then we learned that spend of which that which Allah has provided you and the disbelievers they you know how it is when people don't want to uh, listen they seem to uh, mock at anything that you suggest that when Allah had revealed that spend on people they said well why should we spend on these people if Allah had wanted he would have fed them himself and we, uh, you know, the wider story to this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides for everyone. Allah gives everyone. Now, the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is that you should give to is to see if you actually will, is to give you that, um, that reward for doing something that Allah has commanded you to do. And it's a test that some people have more and some people have less. And other people's risk is in your risks, and in the risk that Allah has provided you. Therefore, it's not, you, you know, you're not giving, like we say, oh, you know, we cut our stomach and give to people. You're not cutting your stomach and giving to people. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is their share in your um, property, in your wealth that you are giving to them. And if Allah wanted, he could have given it to them um, himself. But it's a test for you to see whether you do or not. And everyone has a different, um, uh, uh, well, Allah's, been, Allah's given everybody different amounts of wealth. Some have more to try them to see how they cope, how they deal with it. Some have less to see how, how much sabr and shukr they will have with um, uh, dealing with not having enough. So everyone has a different amount given to them. 
then we learn that when the trumpet is blown and the uh, people come out from their uh, graves, they will say, woe to us who raised us up from our place of sleep. Now, we know about the, um, the, uh, the torment of the grave, and a lot of people will probably be punished in the grave. Well, they will be punished in the grave. But when they wake up, you'd think, well, you know, they're thinking, yes, hooray, I was being punished, but I'm, uh, I'm good now, I'm out of my grave. But the torment of that day, the uh, vastity of that day, the scared, you know, sc scariness of that day will be so great that people will think, Whatever was happening to them in the grave, that was, uh, you know, it was like a nap. It was a walk in the park. So they will think, woe to us who woke us up from our sleep. And the dwellers of paradise will be busy in joyful things. They won't be sitting there thinking, oh, you know, I wish my brother had made it to uh, paradise. I wish so and so. They'll be doing their thing. They'll be enjoying themselves. They'll be enjoying paradise. They'll be doing what they want to do. And of course, with people, we, we as human beings, we always try and work our way around things. And on that day, a man will be so argumentative, so um, uh, trying to get into paradise or trying to um, get free of all the uh, all the sins that he had committed in this dunya. And he will say, you know, I don't accept anyone's um, uh, sort of like witness against me. I want to be a witness against myself. And his mouth will be sealed up. And then his hands will speak, and his legs will uh, speak, and his everything, his eyes will speak, his ears will speak, everything will speak on that day. That his legs will say, I took him to such and such a place, he made me walk to such and such a place. His hands will say, you know, I slapped so and so, I had a, you know, I stole such, such and such. Um, and his ears will say, well, I heard him doing this, I heard him gossiping, I heard him eavesdropping. And so everything that, that he's trying to, you, 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 trying to sort of like say he didn't do, those things will speak themselves and say, yes, he did do this. And they will bear witness against him. And we um, learned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in, in the, the surah that, Whoever we grant a long life to, then we reverse them in creation. Like they are born weak, then they have strength, then they have full strength. Like a child is born weak, can't, cannot do anything for themselves. Then a child is able to do things for themselves. And then we become an adult and we think, yes, you know, we're, we're doing well. We can do everything for ourselves. And then we hit our 60s, 70s. And sometimes it doesn't even, we, we don't actually manage to get to that age and the weakness starts kicking in before that. Then you get to that age and then you start becoming weak. You can't walk so much, you can't do the things that you used to do. So everything is reversed. So all your things that you thought, well, right, I've got everything under control, everything just falls apart at that, uh, later on in life as well. So from weakness, you have strength. And then from strength, you come back to your weakness. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intends to do something, all he does is says, kun, fayakun, be, and it is, and it happens. There's nothing, you know, it doesn't have to do anything else. Now, that was the recap from last week. So, alhamdulillah, let's go on to Surah Safa. So, Surah Safa, those ranged in ranks, alhamdulillah. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, by those ran arranged in ranks, by those who drive the clouds in a good way, by those who bring the book and the Quran from Allah to mankind. So the angels are being mentioned here. The fact that they form rows and the fact that Allah is telling us about the angels, that they form rows in the skies, just as people should be forming rows on the earth to pray. Now, angels move together in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on the day of judgment, they will come in rows again. The Prophet ﷺ once came out to the uh, companions and said, will you, not in, will you not form rows as the angels do before their Lord? The companions said, how do the angels do that? The Prophet ﷺ said that they complete the first row, fill the gaps, and then they move on. And this is how we should be um, making our safs as well. And the beauty and perfection of the prayer is in the saf. So even when you are at home, 
then as a family when you are praying then make a saf properly form your rows properly fill in the gaps stand foot to foot shoulder to shoulder we learn in the hadith from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam that um he used to pass through the rows from one side to the other and he used to make sure that people were standing straight and there were no gaps in between and he would say do not be irregular meaning do not have gaps in the middle and do not be as such that one is little forward and the other is little behind stand straight stand together shoulder to shoulder otherwise your hearts will be in disagreement and he would say that allah and his angels bless those who are near the first rows so who are in amongst the first rows so don't hesitate about going to the front rows um don't hesitate about moving forward to fill in the gaps make the rows beautifully make the rows properly and then the angels are mentioned again about who drives the clouds and those who recite the message the angels who bring the re uh, the revelation and then you we we find when we go to our local masjids we often see our sisters doing their own thing and you can't say anything to anybody because everyone seems to think that they know better what they will do is uh, they will have their own jahannamas which will be quite wide and only they are allowed to stand on that jahannamas you can't actually sort of like push forward or uh, either squeeze near them and be on that because they'll just say oh sorry this is all mine and this is not uh, this is not correct you all have to stand next to each other do not leave gaps you know move forward and we find that a lot of sisters they like to stay at the back because their friends are coming and they're having a chat and they're doing certain things they'll be in some corner you say sisters move up move up move up and they'll be like no we're okay we're okay and not knowing that you are supposed to be if you're taking the trouble to go to masjid because it's not compulsory for women to go to masjid they can if they want to and of course there's ajr if you do that if you happen to be there you've taken the trouble to come why are you not now standing properly in in the subs why are you not standing next to the sisters why are you not moving forward instead of having a little you know um a, a group thing at the back so this is one of the things that we really need to so sort of like um stop sisters from doing and speak to them and say sisters you know please move, please move up please complete the rows and inshallah we should uh, even as women they think oh no it's not um it's not compulsory for women the quran the deen is all applies to the men and the women if you're going to pray at home on your own fair um, you know good and well but if you're at the masjid then please perform your rows properly ayah number 4 verily your god is indeed one the lord of the heavens and the earth and all that is between them and the lord of every point of the sun's rising verily we have adorned the near heavens with the stars for beauty and the sky that we see if you um so sort of like uh, this i mentions that it's the nearest sky it's the world the sky basically and it includes the entire universe because remember that we um, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a hadith we learn that on the night journey the angel jibril took the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam through a certain gate to go beyond the first sky and permission had to be sought at every gate and so imagine how vast this is how huge the dunya is how huge the universe is and we can we are unable to figure out what's what's the size or the shape of it and this is what all part of the first sky so if this is so huge our little you know first sky is uh, um is so massive and we cannot see beyond that then imagine how uh, you know big everything else will be Allah has created seven heavens how massive this creation is and how tiny and small we are amongst this creation and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has adorned the skies with stars so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has adorned them to beautify the skies for us alhamdulillah look at that subhanallah for us to admire ayah number 7 and to guard against every rebellious devil they cannot listen to the higher group of angels for they are pelted away from every side outcast and that is, and theirs is a constant torment except such as snatch away something by stealing and they are pursued by a flaming fire of piercing brightness 
We learn in a hadith that once the companions were sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam, uh, and it was um, sort of uh, it was night time, and they saw a shooting star, and it, it was obviously gave a, um, a dazzling light. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam asked them, said, "What did you used to say about this in the pre-Islamic days? What did you used to say?" And they said, Allah and his messenger knows best, but we used to say that when we see a shooting star, when we see, um, uh, when we see um, something like this, we used to say that a great man had died or a great man had been born. So to them, when they saw a shooting star, it was either some great person was born or some great person had died. The Prophet wasallam said that, there is no, that this is not because of the death of anyone or because of the birth of anyone. The fact is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala issues a command and when he decides to do something, then the angels that are around the throne, they glorify and praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the angels that are under them, they begin to glorify and praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the way down to the lowest sky. And then they ask each other, that what is, your Lord, uh, what is it that your Lord has said? What command was given basically? So when it reaches the angels of the lowest sky over there, the jinns, they try to listen to the conversations that are going on between the angels and they try to find out what is happening. So when the jinns try to do that, the angels chase them away with these, sh with these stars. So this is when we see the, the shooting star or when they used to see the stars, sh um, uh, the stars dazzling. Ayah number 11. Then ask them, are they stronger as, a, um, as creation or those whom we have created? Nay, you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who wondered while they mock at you and at the Quran. And when they are reminded, they pay no attention. And when they see an ayah from Allah, they mock at it. And they say, this is nothing but evident magic. When we are dead and have become dust and bones, shall we then be resurrected? And also our forefathers of old say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yes, and you shall then be humiliated. It will be a single zajira, and behold, they will be staring. They will say, woe to us, this is the day of recompense. It will be said, this is the day of judgment, which you used to deny. It will be said to the angels, assemble those who did wrong, those with, the com with their companions from the devils, and those who used to... Who, who they used to worship instead of Allah and lead them on the way of flaming fire. The flaming fire. So meaning that take them to the hellfire together, together with who? The people who committed wrong with them. Although the word Azwaj is being used here, um, what does Azwaj mean? Azwaj we commonly know it as spouse or wife or uh, husband, but it means companion, it can mean somebody very close to you. So in the hereafter, you will be with your companions, people that were, you know, people that meant something to you, people that you used to follow. So the person will be with those that they used to keep company with. And the Prophet Wasallam said that a person will be with those that he, whom he used to love. But a person will also be with people who were similar to them, meaning um, they used to do the same kind of actions. And on the Day of Judgment, um, these people will be in their little groups, um, just like in, in the dunya, um, in prison. Um, you, in certain prisons, you have people who commit the same sort of crimes. So they will be kept in, in one place. So together and in, in, in there, it will be that they'll be together as well. And they'll be taken into hell together. So because they were together in their crimes, they'll be together in their, um, uh, in, in their punishment of, of, of those crimes. They will be taken together with each person is a shaitan who misleads him. So they will go to the hellfire with that shaitan as well. And um, so, so the people that commit zina, they'll be in a group of people that commit zina. People who um, uh, who, who uh, are, uh, drink alcohol, for instance, they'll be with their group of friends who used to do the same. In, uh, we, we learn in a hadith that the people who don't pray, they will be with Pharaoh and Haman. Why will they be with those people when they didn't even know them, they didn't exist at the same time? 
because the problem with their affair was that he was too arrogant to surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like when a person refuses to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the reason he refuses is because of pride, the fact that he is arrogant because of his ego. So this will be the reason he is entering hell and this will be the reason that he is going to be with, with those, with, with um, um, Pharaoh and uh, Haman. Ayah number. Ayah number 24. But stop them verily, they are to be questioned. What is the matter with you that you do not help one another as you used to in the world? Nay, but that day they shall surrender, and they will turn to one another and question one another. They will say, it was you who used to come to us from the right side. They will reply, nay, you yourself were not believers, and we had no authority over you. Nay, but you were transgressing people. So there, nobody, not even your parents, will take responsibility for your actions, for your choices. You are responsible for your actions and your choices. You will suffer alone and you, you will not be able to put the blame on someone else. Saying, oh, but they did this and I just got sucked into it. I was young and naive and so on. You're not young and naive forever. You will be responsible for your own actions. So do not do things that are... Um, are, are not good, which are wrong, which are sinful, just for the sake of other people, because they're doing it and you're joining in, because they're your friends, they're the people that you hang out with, if you don't hang out with them, then uh, they're, they're going to be thinking, oh, uh, well, you, you know, you'll be on your own or you'll be lonely, but the fact is that on the day of resurrection, then those people will not be your friends, and you will think, I wish I had actually got rid of them in the dunya, while I had the opportunity. I number 30 and we have no I number 30 we'll start with that again and we had no authority over you nay but you were transgressing people so now the word of our Lord has been justified against us that we shall certainly have to taste the torment so we led you astray because we ourselves were astray then verily that day they will all share in the torment certainly that is how we deal with the criminals Truly, when it was said to them, none has the right to be worshipped but Allah, they puffed themselves up with pride and denied. And they said, are we going to abandon our gods for the sake of a mad poet? Nay, he has come with the truth and he confirms the messengers. Verily, you are going to taste the uh, painful torment and you are and you will be requited nothing except for what you used to do. Except the ch chosen slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for them there will be a known provision in paradise, fruits, and they, will sh and they shall be honoured in the gardens of delight, facing one another on thrones. Around them will be passed a cup of pure wine. So you see, the blessings of Jannah are that you have good company as well, because you will be able to drink what you like, you will be able to eat what you like, but if you are on your own, the drink and the eating doesn't sort of like taste or, uh, as, as good. So if you are excluded from a group or if you don't feel connected, if you're not feeling, you know, socially connected, then you, you don't want to be doing all these things. But when you've got a good circle of friends, when you're socially connected, when you've got people around you, then it is a better feeling. So in general, you will not have the feeling of loneliness, being on your own. Oh, it's just me. You will have who you want around you. The people whose company you have enjoyed, the people who have helped you to get, get, to, get to Jannah, the people whose company you like, they will be there. So that is the beauty of paradise. That will be the beauty of Jannah, that you will not be alone and you will not be lonely. You won't have those, you know, anxious days or anything. All right, so iron number 46. I number 45, around them will be passed a cup of pure wine, white delicious to the drinker. Neither will they have goo from that, nor will they suffer intoxication. And besides them will be kisarat al darf, chaste wives, uh, restraining their glances with wide and beautiful eyes. Now, what does that mean? Who is this? Who are these women with the white and beautiful eyes? These women are going to be the Hural Ains of, uh, of Jannah. They will be the wives of the men in, in Jannah. 
and their hus they will be beautiful and their husbands will be handsome. So the companions, one of the companions said that I like to dress up well, I like to look good, just as I would like my wife to look good, look beautiful. So this again is what will happen in Jannah, that each person will be very beautiful, the women will be very beautiful, men will be very handsome. They will be attracted, attractive for their spouses and they will be attracted to their spouses. So they will only desire each other and they won't desire anybody else or they won't desire anything else. Delicate and pure and as if they were hidden eggs, well preserved, and they will turn to one another, mutually questioning. A speaker of them will say, Verily I had a companion in the world. Who used to say, Are you amongst those who believe in resurrection after death? Then when we die and become dust and bones, shall we be indeed raised up to receive reward or punishment according to our deeds? And this happens a lot. We have people like this in our in certain circles that we move around with that they will say oh you really believe that you're going to die and then you're going to be raised up again you think you're going to be rewarded you think that this is going to happen this normally you know these sort of, sort of conversations will take place between co-workers or uh, family members because now we not everybody's family members are muslims when we marry outside the faith uh, and it might be sort of like the wider family but we still have people who are uh, of not the face uh, of not the faith and they will say to you you know do you really believe in this do you really think this will happen you know why do you dress like this and so on so they they're basically trying to make you feel bad trying to sort of like make you um become like uh, become like them so these verses they show us that we need to be very wary of these um people who doubt and they want you to doubt as well so they openly speak of their disbelief and they question and they criticize, they mock, and they try to instill the seeds of doubt in you as well. Don't be affected by them. Resist and avoid their company for they, you know, they, they, they are weak in faith or they have no faith. And they, um, in, in life generally, you will, there will be people that believe and people who don't believe. You will meet all sorts of people. You will interact with all sorts of people. So it is up to people what they want to believe. It is entirely their, their choice. However, if someone is calling you to disbelieve, if someone is criticizing you, if someone is mocking your faith, then, then that's the time when you need to be careful. And you must try and st stay away from those influences. Um, even in the world, if you knew that somebody was a bad person or somebody was a thief or um, somebody uh, was in trouble with the law, um, you, you wouldn't want to um, socialize with them because they would actually take you down with them. So why would you want to do that for your um, akhira? Why would you uh, keep, keep um, company with them and then risk losing your akhira? Because we wouldn't risk uh, doing that to ourselves in the dunya. Like if we knew somebody was... Um, wanted for something and by us uh, doing something for them or doing something with them we could be at risk we could be um, taken to prison or we could be uh, something could happen to us we wouldn't want that so in the, if we don't want that for ourselves in this dunya then why do we want it in for the Akira? so we have acquaintances we be, we're nice to everybody you know we're fantastic we are Muslims we don't uh, shun people we don't um, uh, we're not rude to people but your inner circle your closest friends they are the people that should be righteous servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is where you need to make the dua that, oh Allah, make our friends good, make our friends righteous, the people that we socialize with, people in our neighborhood that we socialize with, because neighborhood is very important as well. There's always people that you will have in the neighborhood that you are socializing with. So, you know, if they're your friends, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make them good. Make dua for righteous company, make dua for righteous friends. <clears throat> so this person that is saying oh um so this is explaining about in the hereafter when someone will think about oh this person used to say this so what actually happened to them so now it tells us about what ha actually happens to happen to them a speaker will say look look down so he will look down and see him in the midst of fire He's, um, he said, by Allah, you nearly ruined me. Had it not been for the grace of my Lord, I would certainly have been amongst those brought forth to hell. 
the dwellers of paradise will say, are we then not to die anymore, except our first death? And we shall not be punished after we enter paradise. Truly, this is the supreme success. For the like of this, um, uh, for, uh, for the like of this, let the workers work. Is that paradise better entertainment or the tree of Zakun? Truly, we have made it as a trial for the wrongdoers. Verily, it is a tree that springs out from the bottom of the hellfire. The shoots of its fruits stalks are like the heads of shaitan. Truly, they will eat their form and fill their bellies there, uh, therewith. Then on top of uh, then on the top of that they will be given boiling water to drink, so that it becomes a mixture of boiling water and zakum in their bellies. Then thereafter verily their return is to the flaming fire of hell. Verily they found their forefathers on the wrong path. So they too hastened in their footsteps, and indeed most of men of old went astray before them. And indeed we sent amongst them warners then see what was the end of those who were warned but he did not except the chosen slaves of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and indeed nuha invoked us and we are the best of those who answered the request and we rescued him and his family from the great distress and his progeny but then we made this we made the survivors made them survivors and left for him a goodly remembrance amongst the later generation peace be upon nuha from us amongst the alameen Verily thus we reward the doers of good. Verily he, Nua, was one of our believing slaves. Then we drowned the others. And verily amongst those, uh, amongst those who followed his, uh, his way was, was Ibrahim, peace be upon him, when he came to his Lord with a pure heart. So the pure heart is mentioned in the Quran twice. And both times it is mentioned with the contents of Ibrahim, uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam. In Ibrahim, peace be upon him, his life teaches us about a sound heart, about having a gullible Salim. Salim is something which has, um, that which has survived, not something that, um, uh, not someone that has never suffered or something that has never suffered or someone that was never attacked, but someone who has survived this, these things. So this shows us that there are trials in life, and there are those questions, there are those personal wars going on, there are external forces which are pulling us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, the, the, this could be things like um, shirk that is around us, or the faithlessness of people that is around us that we've just spoken about. Um, the doubts that people raise and then they creep into you, the questions that we may have, you know, the personal battles that we may be fighting. But the person who holds on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves those people. So the sound heart is the heart that is free of shirk, that is safe, that is free of associating any partners with Allah, that is free of any shak, any doubt. And Ibrahim alayhi salam had tawheed. And this is why he loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most. He was obedient to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He surrendered to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he surrendered fully. Not just, you know, I surrender and then do as you please. But he surrendered fully. So there was nothing that he feared or loved or longed for as much as he loved, feared and longed for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He had yakin and he had itminan in the heart. So he believed, he was certain and he also had itminan in the heart, so like the comfort of the heart. Which is why in Surah Baqarah, if you remember when we studied Surah Baqarah, he said that I want my heart to be reassured. Because he, he not that he disbelieved, but he just needed that, his, that reassurance. Because if you doubt, then it doesn't allow you to act. So he had that conviction in his heart. The conviction brings you strength. To do something and the conviction gives you the power to stand up so ibrahim alayhi salam his heart was free from any type of shirk and ibrahim alayhi salam was not bitter <coughs> he survived in the sense also so we um ibn sarin was asked that what is the sound heart what is a sound heart he said it is the one that is sincere to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in regards to his creation meaning that he wants the best for the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
And Ibrahim was exactly like that. He wanted the best for the people. He said to his father, he said, uh, who, the father said to Ibrahim that leave or I will kill you. But what did Ibrahim say to his father? That I will pray for you. His entire community threw him into the fire. They built a fire and threw him into it. What was um, Ibrahim's response to this? He said, I will seek forgiveness for them. I will, and he will seek forgiveness for his father. So the angels came to him and they told him about um, the fact that they were going to the people of Luth and they were all going to be destroyed. He pleaded with them. He said, give them more time. Maybe they will start, you know, um, st uh, start uh, acting upon Islam. Maybe they will uh, give up their, uh, their, uh, their um, ways. So he it was everything that he did was for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for the betterment of the community and for the betterment of others. So Ibrahim, peace be upon him, he left his child in a barren valley. Why did he do that? So that there would be a, a nation of people who would worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that barren valley. And his heart was free of shirk, filled with belief, filled with love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was a survivor. And he did not have any bitterness towards people, none at all. And this is something that is very important to our, uh, you know, for our, for us, for our deen, for our um, lifestyles. The sound heart is um, okay. You know, we sort of think the heart, the heart is going to be sound when we just make zikr and we claim we love Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Making zikr does make your heart sound. But then there's other things around it as well. There's like we sit here making zikr and then straight away somebody says something, we get really angry and we, uh, uh, we start, um, um, so things happen. But the sound heart is where you mellow, you think, okay, so they've said things, it doesn't matter, we're going to have to deal with this. We, we, you know, you don't be angry at people, you're not jealous at people. A heart is clean, uh, your heart is clean of all these ills and all these vices. He had, so Ibrahim, peace be upon him, had a sound heart, a clean, pure, sincere heart. And the, the fact that he made peace with everybody. Sometimes we are at peace with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we are not at peace with Allah uh, with the people, with the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't forgive them, um, we don't pardon them, we keep enmity between um, the, them and us. We keep uh, grudges and hatreds in our heart. We don't forgive them. By that, all we're doing is really torturing ourselves. We're just thinking, well, m you know, we think that we're doing the other person harm, but in actual fact, you are harming yourself. I remember <clears throat> 85, when he said to his father and to his people, what is it that you, which you worship? It is all falsehood. This, these gods that you are worship, worshipping, who are they? They are the people that you desire. They are not God. Then what, then what do you think about the, about the Lord of the Alameen? Then he cast a glance at their stars. And he said, verily, I am sick with the plague. And this was to trick them to remain in the temple with the idols, to destroy them and not to accompany the people to a pagan festival. So they turned away from him and departed for the fear of the disease when they returned to the gods and said, will you, so then he returned to the gods and said, will you not eat of the offering before you? That what is the matter with you that you speak not? Then he turned upon them, striking them with his hand. Then they, the worshippers, came towards him, hastening. He, he said, worship you that which you yourselves have carved while Allah has created you and what you make. They said, Build for him a blazing fire and throw him into it. So they plotted a plot against him, but we made them the lowest. And he said, after his rescue from the fire, verily I am going to my Lord. He will guide me. My, uh, he will guide me. My Lord, grant me offspring from the righteous. So we gave him the glad tidings of a forbearing boy. So he lost his father. He lost his family. He was thrown out of um, the, the where he lived, out of um, the village or the town. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him something better. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him something even better than what he had in, in the past. And this is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when you do something for the sake of Allah, then Allah will give you something better. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
gave Ibrahim السلام, the good news of a boy, of a boy who was Halim, very forbearing. And what does forbearing mean? It means that in life that there will be difficulties. Things will happen which we do not like and these things, things that we do not like, we find them very difficult. But hill is the ability to bear the difficulty, to not respond with impatience, not to start wailing and fussing and crying over things that happen. Um, of course, there are children uh, are, who are like that, who are very courageous, who are very patient, who are very mature, who are very un understanding. And Ismail, peace be upon him, was like that. And what was the proof of that? The story that we are now going to read. Ayah number 102. And when he, his son, was old enough to walk with him, he said, O oh my son, I have seen in a dream that I am slaughtering you, offering you in sacrifice to Allah. So what do you think? He said, My father, do you do that which you are commanded? Inshallah, you will find me patient. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he asked his son, he didn't ask his son like, Oh, shall I do this or shall I not do this? Do you think we should or do you think we shouldn't? He was asking his son so he would get his son to agree. So that his son would understand why he is doing what he is doing. Why he is doing such a thing. And his son would also be firm and he would be willing and he would be patient. And this is very important that when we do something, we have our children, when we tell our children to do something, then we have to explain to them what our reasons are not just because i say so most of the time that's our reason is because we say so but ibrahim peace be upon him he explained the reason to him that i have seen in a dream that i am sacrificing you for the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and look at the response of ismail uh, peace be upon him that if allah wills you will find me patient so uh, why does he say if allah wills because nothing is possible without the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, um, in a way, this is um, seeking the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Most of the time when we say inshallah, we say it because we think, oh, well, we're not really going to do it, so we'll just say the words inshallah. Inshallah is when you are looking to do something and the help of Allah will come. And if you look at his uh, patience in a hadith, we learn that when Ibrahim, peace be upon him, laid um, Ismail uh, down on his forehead um, and Ismail salam, was wearing a white shirt at that time. So he said, oh my father, I do not have another shirt in which you will be able to bury me with. So let me remove my shirt so that you may have a shirad for me. So Ibrahim, peace be upon him, reached forward to remove the shirt when he was called out from behind that, oh Ibrahim, you have fulfilled your dream. So when he looked back, there was a white big horned, big eyed sheep that was standing over there. Ayah number 103. Then when they had both submitted themselves to the will of Allah and he had laid him prostrate on his forehead, we called out to him, O Ibrahim, you have fulfilled your dream. Thus do we, thus do we reward the doers of good. Verily that indeed was a manifest clear trial and we uh, we ransomed him with a great sacrifice and we left for him a goodly remembrance amongst the later generation so notice how they both submitted and this is what we should desire that we surrender to allah not just us but our children as well and it is only possible if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it possible for us so if you instill in your children the fear of allah and the love of allah and the willingness to obey then it is possible that even little children, they will, um, uh, they will want to do things with you, to, you know, like pray and sacrifice and so on. So where, um, uh, in uh, ayah number 108, is where the, the um, concept or the tradition of um, sacrifice is, has come into it or uh, has begun. Um, it's not about the meat, it's not about the blood, it's about the state of the heart. It's um, about the state of the heart which because sacrificing is the symbol of sacrificing one's ego uh, one's attachment one's love for the dunya one's love for the creation and we see that when a person does something good then Allah also gives them a good name meaning that these people are remembered 
and people mention them in good terms. People mention them in terms which are great, even after that, after they have gone, if you know, after they have left the dunya. <clears throat> Peace be upon Ibrahim. Thus did we reward the doers of good. Verily, he was one of our believing slaves, and we gave him glad tidings of Ishaq, a prophet from the righteous, and we blessed him and Ishaq, and of the of their progeny are some who do right, and some that plainly wrong themselves. So, parents, they may be righteous. These parents were righteous. And some of the children, they're righteous, and some of the children, they're not righteous. So it is not enough that we think that our parents are righteous and, and that's good in us. We have to leave the wrong ourselves. And at times it happens where a person has done their best to raise good children, but despite their efforts, despite their best efforts, they don't see good results. But in that case, do not blame yourself. It is not your fault. You did whatever was in your capacity. You try to bring them up the best you can. Seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, Allah will obviously judge you for where you fell short. Others cannot judge you. People in this dunya, they, they, they do not know what has happened or how you have brought your children up. And some children, are, when they turn out not, you know, um, not pious, and people seem to think, okay, it must be your fault, you've done something wrong. But it is the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some are right and some are not, uh, you know, some are righteous and some... Some are not, and it happens to many, many people that their parents might be righteous, but the children are not. And then it happens the other way as well, as well where the children are righteous and the and their parents are not. So let's have a quick um, summary of uh, what we have learnt today. We learnt that enjoy the blessings of Allah and be grateful. A lot of the time, what happens is we have blessings. One, we can't see the blessings because we think we have a right over these things. And two, we're, we're not grateful because we think we have a God-given right of, um, to, to these things. We think that everybody has these things. We think we, ha we just have what we have and that's, that's good enough. We, we're not thinking that it is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Enjoy your blessings and be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People's opinions should not put us off worshipping Allah. Not because, you know, they say, oh, what, what is this? You know, every five minutes you're going off to pray. Oh, why are you wearing the scarf? Why are you doing this? People's opinions are not important. People's opinions are not what we should be taking into account. Keep your life simple and well organized so you know what you're doing and when you're, or when you're doing it. You know when it's time to pray, you know you've organized yourself that at this time I will be doing this, so therefore I will be able to pray with great ease. If I'm traveling, I can do this and I will be able to pray with great ease. So um, disciplining yourself is what will, or what will work. And also disciplining yourself is what will make you reach your... Um, goal, and we must all have our religious, uh, uh, spiritual goals as well. The people um, will be gathered with their own kind. So whoever you hang around with, you will be gathered with them. Whoever you admire, whoever you try to imitate, whoever you try to be like, you will be gathered with them. And we will all be answerable for our own action and no one else will take responsibility. So these people that you may be gathered with, they're not going to be taking any of your burden. They're just going to be there to watch you suffer and perhaps put in a few, you know, um, last nails in the coffin as, uh, as they speak, uh, as you know, so to speak. The people will heaven, uh, of heaven uh, will, um, uh, will see the people who try to put them off doing all the righteousness. Remember we read the uh, ayahs about when the suddenly a person thinks, well, in the world I used to know this person who used to say to me, oh, do you really believe that, you know, you're going to be accounted for and there's a day of resurrection and so on? So you will know what actually happened in the world and you will be thinking of these things. And he will be shown that, look, this is that person. And that person will be in hell. And then he will say, you know, thank God I didn't listen to what he said. Because he is ruined and he very nearly ruined me as well. So people um, in heaven will be, see, or will be able to see the people who used to try and put them off these things and try and to keep them away from the deen and so on. And the people of hellfire will be given the zakum tree 
uh, uh, fruits from the zakum tree, which is a tree from the uh, pit of the hellfire, and boiling water to drink. And then it, it explained that as soon as they've had that, they're going to be taken back to the the, uh, the hellfire. So basically, basically, they're coming out for dinner time. They're coming out for lunch. And after they've had their lunch break, they're going to be taken back into the hellfire. Ibrahim, peace be upon him, came to his Lord with a pure heart. He had suffered, but he had stayed focused. He stayed humble. He stayed focused. He still worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wanted to help other people. He wanted other people to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wanted to show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he, he, he wanted other people to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same light as he was. He was um, uh, a servant of Allah. He wanted people to be also be the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He broke the idols and he, we've so, so like covered this story in the past, where he broke the idols and he said it was the big one that did this. Just to show these people that, you know, if these idols, they are unable to protect themselves, then why do you think that they'll be able to protect you? You think that, oh, well, you know, these idols um, have um, uh, are protecting us, then why cannot they not protect themselves? If they fall out over, they can't pick themselves up. You yourselves carved them with your own hands. You yourself painted them with your own hands. You went and paid the money to buy this thing. Then you've put it on your shelf. And here you are worshipping um, whatever it is. Do you really think this makes sense? If someone can't see, if someone can't hear, if someone can't um, uh, uh, so sort of like, you know, pick them up, up if they're fallen over, they're your God, you are worshipping them. Do you not see, you know, where where you're going wrong? So that, but his people did not listen to him. They were like, they were blind followers of the people f from the past. So they just thought, well, what shall we do with this person? Oh yeah, let's get rid of him. So they built a fire and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the fire cool and safe for Ibrahim, peace be upon him. Um, once he came out of the fire, he made his hijra and Ibrahim, peace be upon him, his wife Sarah and his nephew Luke, they were the first people to make hijra for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to leave a land for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to make hijra. So they were the first to leave. And he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a pious child, Rabbi Habli Nina Salihin, which was in, in, this, um, um, in these ayahs that we just read. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a child. And this was another test in itself, when Allah gave him a child in his old age, and then Allah asked him to sacrifice the child. And again, a test. Um, you know, I've just had a child in such an uh, such a sort of like an old age, and yet you want me to sacrifice him? Can you can you sort of like with us with our reasonings would we really be able to do this? And he he did not question anything. He said immediately he um uh, he adhered to the command of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. It was a test, and he passed his test with flying colours. Whereas with us, we would say, oh, you know, we'll give anything else, we'll give everything else, but we don't want our child to be, you know, put through, put through this. But it was a test from Allah, and he adhered to it, and mm -hmm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the son back, and more, uh, and so on. And we, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with Ishaq, uh, and of their progeny, there are some that are right, and then some that are plainly wrong, which is what we were just discussing now that uh, some of them, uh, you know, with, with all people, some children are good and some children are not good. So we will now say goodbye to our Facebook friends and our YouTube friends. And let's see if anybody's got any.